Welcome to Catholic Theological Union. I'm Sister Barbara Reed, president of CTU, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Winter Shapiro Lecture. The Catholic Jewish Studies Program hosts three Shapiro Lectures each year at CTU, made possible through the generosity of the Shapiro Family Foundation. For many decades, they have enabled CTU to invite world-renowned scholars to speak on a range of topics related to theology, current issues, and culture. For those of you who may be new to CTU, we were founded in 1968 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, which issued the groundbreaking document Nostra Aetate, the Declaration on the Relation of the Church with Non-Christian Religions. Since our founding, CTU has been very committed to interreligious dialogue, especially through our Catholic Jewish Studies and Catholic Muslim Studies programs. We are grateful for the leadership of Father John Polakowski and Ra Rabbi Chaim Perlmuter of Blessed Memory, two of our founding faculty members who established the Catholic Jewish Studies program at CTU and who launched the deep and lasting friendships that have been formed between CTU and our Jewish partners in the last five plus decades. In 2001, CTU established a chair in Jewish studies made possible by a most generous gift of Lester and Renee Crown and Patrick and Shirley Ryan. The chair has been held since 2014 by Dr. Malka Zyger Simkovich, who also directs the Catholic Jewish Studies program at CTU. I now ask Dr. Simkovich to introduce our esteemed guest lecturer. Thank you, Sister Barbara. Good evening to our friends here in Chicagoland and to all our friends who are joining us this evening or morning or afternoon from all over the world. My name is Malka Sinkovich and I'm very glad to welcome you to this year's Winter Shapiro Lecture sponsored by CTU's Catholic Jewish Studies Program. Tonight's lecture, as Sister Barbara said, is part of our Shapiro Lecture Series, which hosts renowned Jewish Studies scholars three times a year on subjects pertaining to Jewish history, scriptures, and theology. And I'm so thrilled to see that we have so many people with us tonight to hear our featured speaker, Dr. Joel Kaminsky. Dr. Kaminsky is the Morning Star Family Professor of Jewish Studies and a professor of Bible in the Religion Department at Smith College, where he has taught since 1997. His research explores the intersection between narrative and theological currents in the Hebrew Bible and rabbinic literature, and seeks to illuminate the distinct ways that Jews and Christians over the past two millennia have interpreted the Hebrew Bible. Dr. Kaminsky is the author of many books, but I want to highlight in particular his 2007 work, Yet I Loved Jacob, Reclaiming the Biblical Concept of Election. This work has been profoundly impactful, not only to scholars who work on the Hebrew Bible as specialists, but also to countless students and lay people interested in the subject of chosenness. It made such an impression on me as a graduate student that after reading it, I decided to write a doctoral dissertation that explored the theme of Jewish universalism in the Hebrew Bible in the Second Temple period. And today I still enthusiastically recommend Dr. Kaminsky's scholarship to friends, students, and colleagues. So I'm especially excited to have the privilege of hosting him here this evening. And I also want to welcome Dr. Kaminsky's student, Grayson Hawthorne, a senior at Smith College, who will be assisting him this evening with the lecture. We will leave aside time for questions at the end, but feel free to post questions in the chat box anytime throughout the lecture, uh, ideally in the second half, um, if you can wait. And you can also send questions directly to me. And during the Q&A session, I will then direct some of these questions to Dr. Kaminsky, uh, and we'll have a facilitated conversation. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joel Kaminsky. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna say, Thank you so much to Malka Simkovich for inviting me and to Barbara Reed for her introduction and Peter Cunningham for helping uh, uh, organize the technical and other aspects of the lecture um, and for everyone at CTU for arranging this. Uh, I also wanna quickly mention that tonight happens to be my father's York site, the anniversary of his death. So 
If I say anything relatively intelligent, may it be to his merit. If I slip up, may it not be to his merit. Um, I, I thought I'd start by uh, maybe saying a little bit how I came to be interested in this topic instead of just launching into talking about the topic. Uh, it'll give you a little bit of background. So in the 1990s, as a budding biblical scholar, uh, when I was teaching, I think maybe at St. Olaf at that point, I was asked to be on a review panel to review what they call an Old Testament theology. This particular one is called by this guy named Rolf P. Canerum. He was born German, but he taught it um, out west at Claremont Colleges, Claremont Graduate Union. It's called the Task of Old Testament Theology. And I was asked to be on this review panel reviewing this book. And Professor Canerum, I had a lot of problems with the book because he really argued that the Hebrew Bible had two streams in it. One stream was a particularistic stream that highlighted the notion of Israel's God's special favor toward the people of Israel. And there was another stream that was universalist that, that uh, had a drive toward justice and egalitarianism. And he argued that those two streams were in opposition to each other and that ultimately over the biblical period, the egalitarian stream uh, outshone and sort of put into the rear view mirror the notion of Israel's special election. Um, I found it problematic for a number of reasons. One being, I don't really think the ancients thought of justice in egalitarian terms. We won't get into that at length, but I, I think they, they, they did not see the two as equivalences. Um, but more than that, around the same time that I was on this review panel, not that much before then, in the early 90s, my, my mentor, Professor John Levinson, uh, wrote a book called The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son, this book here. I don't know if the title's look in reverse on here or not. I can't remember how that works. Um, Malka could put some of that in the chat if you want to see it. But he wrote a book, The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son, where he argued at length that the theme of divine favor pervaded the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. And it was a theme that both linked and also divided Jews and Christians, which is kind of the thesis of my talk today. Um, thirdly, another intersecting point of interest was when we moved out east to take the job at Smith, I had gotten married that year and my lovely wife, Jody, had took a job at a reconstructionist synagogue down the road in Amherst as the education director for the Hebrew school and adult ed. And um, Reconstructionism rejects the notion of Jewish election. And so when we spent time in synagogue hearing how they sort of redid the liturgy, and um, uh, I found uh, it problematic to try to eliminate the notion of Israel's special favor from the Jewish liturgy. In fact, at one point, I actually penned an essay published in Midstream called Attempting the Impossible, Eliminating Election from the Jewish liturgy. So all three of these things were operative and got me interested in trying to articulate, well, if we have this notion, what are the biblical roots of it? What are the different pieces of it? Um, now, I'm not going to talk about, it's a whole other lecture to talk about the meaning and purpose of election in the Hebrew Bible, but we'll do a little bit of summary here and look at some things. So I'm going to screen share a little bit, and I'm going to start and have Grayson uh, read for us quote number one once I put it up here. So that's this, and then we'll share. Grayson, can I get you to read quote one from Genesis 12 for us? Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed or will bless themselves by you. Yeah, the last word in Genesis 12, 3b is hotly debated. Is it a passive? Is it a reflexive? Um, but in any case, we see some very interesting things here. In the Bible, for starters, we see that there's not a lot of rationale for why God calls and favors Abraham. Or as my mentor, Professor Levinson says, bolts out of the blue, 
God contacts Abraham. We'll see a little later in this talk that uh, the early rabbis were not as comfortable with that notion and they invent a whole sort of backstory to this. But in the Bible, we really don't have much of a backstory. And the calling of Abraham is about God's special favor toward Abraham and his descendants, but it has implications for all the families of the earth. Um, then we're going to turn to quote two. Grayson, can I get you to read quote two for us? Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his, any other of his children because he was a son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him Right now I bring this up because the Joseph story a lot of the stories in Genesis of of chosenness involve a favored son and a disfavored son or sons could be multiple sons. In Joseph's case, it's his 10 older brothers and the sort of rivalry that forms between the chosen and the non-chosen, often threatening the life of the chosen. This is really at the core of Professor Levinson's book, The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son, where he shows that this theme has very deep roots in the Hebrew Bible and that in many ways, those deep roots, as we'll see in a, in a minute or two, also manifest in the New Testament in which Jesus is a beloved son who is also endangered and ultimately exalted. He first suffers a death, and then a resurrection, hence the, the title of my mentor's book, The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son. But you can see that there's a lot of stories in Genesis, Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, right? David and his brothers later, right? There's a, there's a lot of these stories. And I should mention that there's also favored women involved. There's Sarah and Hagar with Sarah being favored. There's Hannah and Penina with Hannah being favored in Samuel. So this is a common theme and it has abiding roots in really both Testaments, both in the Jewish Bible and in the Christian Bible. Um, and we'll look at one other passage. We can't, I don't, I can't spend, I mean, I could spend all day, but we're not going to spend all day looking at passages in the Hebrew Bible, because I want to do some comparison. Um, Grayson, can I get you to read quote three for us? For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on. You, uh, you yeah. and chose you for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Yeah, so here we see the sort of chosenness seems to be partially connected to the promise to the patriarchs. Of course, God calling the patriarchs is mysterious in itself. And it's also linked to God's love for the people of Israel itself a sort of mysterious feature of the Bible. Um, now, the truth is that contemp among many, contempor many contemporary Christians have a view that the Jews think they're the chosen people, but Christians have a universal religion and don't really see themselves as particularly favored by, by God, um, or having this notion of being specially favored. But the truth is, for most of Christian history, Jews and Christians have in fact argued over which of them is the chosen people, not with Jews claiming they're the chosen people and Christians claiming that chosenness is a passe notion. So we can see this when we look at certain fundamental election texts in the New Testament. Grayson, can I get you to read quote four for us? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of, dark, out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Right. So you can see very clearly here in one of the New Testament epistles or letters, language of special chosenness and Christian, Gentile Christians being brought into this theme of special chosenness. In fact, this passage plays quite a bit off the language in Exodus 19, 
when Israel shows up at Mount Sinai. It has reverberations of those exact things. In quote five, we don't have to read it, but it's the passage from Mark when uh, Jesus is baptized by John. And as he's coming out of the water, the heavens come apart and a spirit descends on him. And, it's a, and a voice comes from heaven and says, you are my son, the beloved, or you are my beloved son, if you prefer, with whom I am well pleased, right? Here we see the theme of Jesus, like the people of Israel, receiving special divine favor. Of course, that is both a positive and it also has complicating consequences because as we know from many of the stories of God's beloved and chosen ones, that they offer, they often uh, are persecuted or suffer death or near death experiences. Um, need we say Cain is sort of example A, Jesus is an example B of people who, who are favored, who experience, in this case, not near death, but actual death experiences. Um, then I have another quote on here from Ephesians that's also very similar, um, speaking to Gentile Christians of being aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel, but now being brought in. So it's important to remember because, again, I think many Christians today see themselves as universalists. They tend to not realize that they tend to not be a, that forwardly aware of like the genealogy in Matthew that links Jesus back to Abraham specifically. That, and the way in which Paul sees Gentiles being able to be linked to God through by Jesus's link to, to Abraham again, right? There's this linkage, Jesus to Abraham, that the seed that Abraham has promised to Christians is seen to be Jesus. Jesus is a seed that gives Gentile Christians access to Israel's God. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about the ways in which Jews and Christians each take aspects of the Hebrew Bible's election theology um, in different directions. And I'm going to make some generalizations, even though I'm also going to point out that there are exceptions to these generalizations. So I guess what, I, what, I'm, what I'm going to say is the generalizations might be the general ocean temperature of Judaism and Christianity broadly conceived. And the exceptions are recognizing that Judaism and Christianity are not single entities. They are broad ranging traditions that are thousands of years old that have a variety of voices. And you can, if you look around, find voices in a Christian tradition that sound very Jewish and in a Jewish tradition that sound very Christian. So we're gonna look at some of each of those, but we're also gonna talk about the general ocean temperature and make some generalizations, even while we're recognizing that we're making those generalizations and their exceptions to the rule. So, in quote seven, can I get you to start reading that for us, Grayson? We probably won't read the whole thing, but I'll get you to start reading. Go ahead. Is this blessedness then pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? We say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the ancestor of all who believe without being circumcised and who, who would thus have righteousness reckoned to them. And likewise, the ancestor of the circumcised who are not only circumcised, but who also follow the example of the faith that our ancestor Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or who, to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Right, so here, here's the thing. It doesn't take a genius to figure out based on sort of Luther's proclamation that faith receives greater attention than human deeds, particularly in Protestant Christianity, but even in Christianity, even in Catholic Christianity, I think that is often the case. And thus, oftentimes Judaism is depicted as a works righteousness religion and Christianity as a religion of grace. And you see some of this in, in Paul 
of course, that leaves a problem for Paul. The problem is if Abraham is the model of faithfulness, then why does he have to get circumcised? How does he explain the fact that he has to do something? And Paul says, well, in Genesis 15, Abraham is already told by God that he is righteous. Before, two chapters before in Genesis 17, he's circumcised. So Paul says, even if circumcision happened, it's not what makes Abraham righteous. It's a supplementary sign after he's already declared righteous. You don't really have to do anything. It's all by God's grace. So Jews and Christians kind of have an argument. I think Judaism and Christianity both have elements of works and elements of grace. The question is the balance. I think on balance, Christianity tends to put more emphasis on grace. Judaism tends to put a bit more emphasis on works, particularly on the importance of the 613 mitzvot, the commandments that, that traditional Jews see God as, as having given to the people of Israel. Now, as I said, there's exceptions, and I happen to, we're not, we don't have to read it, but I happen to have in quote eight here, a quote from James, and James, I'm not, you know, scholars are skeptical that it's a direct attack on Paul, but certainly James makes a large argument sort of pointing out that Abraham actually had to do things in order to please God. In particular, he points to the episode of the binding of Isaac. It's not so clear, James is saying, that when God shows up in Genesis 22, it says, take your son, your only son, uh, your only beloved son, Isaac, and, and take him up to the mountain and bind him and prepare to sacrifice him, that Abraham could say, you know, six chapters earlier in Genesis 15, you told me I was righteous. I think I'm out, but we're still okay, right? right? Joel, not... I'm sorry to cut in. Do you mind scrolling down so we can see this? Oh, oh yeah, oh, I'm sorry. My Thank bad. You. Oh, the... Thank you for cutting in. You are you are absolutely right. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Malka. I'm, I'm not great about the multiple moving things. There we go. So there is the James quote. You can see it there. I'm sorry about that. You're fine. Um, anyway, so James says, you know, Abraham did have to do things and faith without works is dead. So you can see the sort of exception thing. And you might also see it for example, in Matthew 25, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, where Jesus says, it's about what you do to the least of these. That's what earns you a place in heaven. In some sense, Matthew 25 is a very Jewish text. It says, fulfilling the commandments of charity and clothing the naked and feeding the hungry are essential elements of what makes you righteous. And just believing is not enough. You actually, so there are certainly exceptions in Christianity. Now, if you went to Judaism and you went through the rabbinic corpus and you collected every place where the rabbis praised the importance of the commandments, you would have an, you could collect thousands of these references. But I did find a reference where the rabbis put an emphasis on faith, sort of overworks something that sounds very Christian in the rabbinic corpus. Grayson, can I get you to read a quote nine for us? And so you also find that our father Abraham inherited both this world and the world beyond only as a reward for the faith which he with which he believed, as it is said, and he believed in the Lord, etc. And so you also find that Israel was redeemed from Egypt only as a reward for the faith which with which they believed, as it is said, and the people believed. Right, very good. So I'm trying to show you again, ocean temperature, the ocean temperature of Judaism is the mitzvot, the commandments are really a path to salvation. Now I should mention that in the rabbinic corpus and in Judaism in general, God giving the gift of the Torah that includes the commandments is an act of grace. So it's not like there's not grace there, right? But in order to activate the relationship between God and the people of Israel fully, you have to do the commandments, which does involve human activity, right? In Christianity, in some sense, the emphasis is more on that radical act of grace. Years ago, there was a scholar, Michael David Goldberg, who published a sort of analysis of the two master stories in Judaism and Christianity, the master story of Judaism being the Exodus account 
and the master story of Christianity being the gospel story of Jesus's life, passion, death, and resurrection. And he pointed out that in Judaism, in the Israelite story, humans are much more active. Moses is involved, the midwives are involved, people are doing things. In the New Testament story, ultimately, whatever the humans do screws things up and Jesus ends up dead. The person who fixes things is God. In the Hebrew Bible, God can't really fix things totally. He needs humans to help fix things. So I think you do see that emphasis in those master stories coming out. Just something to think about. Um, so another thing is Jews, and, so the grammars of Judaism and Christianity are, are quite different. And because their conceptions of what election means is different and how they conceive of others is different, um, they have different stances around important things such as the status of non-believers and the importance of converting or missionizing non-believers. So um, Grayson, can I get you to read quote 10 for us from the New Testament, from the Gospel of John? And yeah, for can... anyone who's ever been to an NFL game or seen one on TV, there's always a guy standing in the end zone with a sign that says John 316. This is this verse, go ahead. Could you scroll down so everyone can see? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. My bad. No worries. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave oh, his only son. Go, <laughs> Go ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of god right so it's important right christians right in the, at the end of the gospels there's a charge and i have that end of the, matthew at the end of matthew there's a charge all authority is given to you he says to the apostles right and go out right go out and baptize among the nations in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit there's a commission to bring Christianity to the world. Now, you, many Christians have at times accused Jews of withholding God's message. Jews just see things differently. Judaism tends to see the job of Jews is to be Jews. And if it's going to have an effect on the world, it's going to be through their exemplary behavior it's not going to be because they're out there missionizing people. It doesn't mean that they think that God's not working through the people of Israel. They just don't feel that there's an active call. And in fact, when you want to convert, Judaism, since the rabbinic period, accepts converts. It's not clear in ancient Israel that there were really converts. That's a whole other conversation. But in the rabbinic, from the rabbinic period, from about 2,000 years ago uh, forward, there is a procedure to convert. Um, but when you go to convert, the first thing that the rabbi says to you is, why would you want to do that? You don't have to do that. You don't need this headache. You could be perfectly right with God. You don't need the headache. Right now, you only have to keep a very limited number of commandments. If you become a Jew, there's a whole list of things. Plus, we're persecuted people. You don't need the headache. Stay as you are, right? So there's not this movement to life because the grammars are different. Now, Grayson, can I get you to read quote 12 for us? And you'll see some of this grammar. You'll also see an internal argument among different rabbinic authorities about the status of non-Israelites. Go ahead, Grayson. Rabbi Eliezer declares that none of the Gentiles is a portion in the world to come on the basis of Psalm 918, English 917. But his statement is decisively challenged by Rabbi Joshua, who shows that the wording of this Psalm, which says, all the Gentiles literally nations, who forget God, indicates that there are also righteous people among the nations of the world who do have a portion in the world to come. Meaning those Gentiles who don't forget God, right? And that's really the standard Jewish position, which is that, yes, there are wicked Gentiles out there, but there are righteous Gentiles out there, and righteous Gentiles have as much of a place in the world to come as righteous Jews without becoming Jews. Okay. Let me uh, go over here to this quote sheet and toggle down here. So Judaism and Christianity have opposite problems related 
to the status of the law. So the Sinai event is a huge part of the Torah of the first five books. In fact, three fifths of the first five books is taken up with Sinai and legislation from Sinai. So it would seem to be relatively important. So you might say, well, how is Paul going to deal with that? If Paul thinks that Gentiles don't need to keep the law, they don't need to become Jews in order to, in, in order to, in order to receive Jesus's message, you know, how, how, how can this work? So Gracie, can I get you to start reading quote number 13 for us? Just as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Brothers and sisters, I give an example from daily life. Grayson, Grayson, I want you to skip down a couple of sentences to where it says, my point is this. <laughs> He'll get to the point. My point is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise, but God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made, and it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Okay, so here's the thing. The argument that we saw earlier in Romans and the argument in Galatians are slightly different. In Romans, Paul is slightly more honest. He recognizes that Abraham himself does at least one of the commandments of the law, circumcision, but he says, well, that still occurred after this passage in Genesis 15 where God declared Abraham righteous. So you could be righteous without circumcision. Here, he's, uh, he, he sort of says, well, Abraham and all the patriarchs were righteous. They didn't have the Sinai law. How could they be righteous? How could they be good people? The law came 430 years later, but then he needs to find a way to sort of knock down the position of the law. And he tries a variety of strategies, right? He says it came from angels right through a mediator, um, it's a temporary measure, right? He's got these different ways to try to explain it. Now the rabbis actually have the inverse problem. They have to explain if Mount Sinai is so important, why doesn't the Torah start with Mount Sinai? Why isn't Abraham receive, why isn't Abraham occur after Mount Sinai? How can you have the first Jew without Mount Sinai? They have an explanation for it, the rabbis. Grayson, read quote 14 for us. We thus find that our father Abraham had practiced the whole Torah in its entirety before it had been given. As it is said, inasmuch as Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my laws, and my teachings. Yeah, the rabbis noticed this overloaded language in Genesis 26. Abraham obeyed me. He kept my charge, my commandments, my laws, my teachings. And they derive from it, Abraham received through a revelation or somehow or another knew the whole Sinai law before the Sinai law was given. So you see there's inverse problems. For Paul, the giving of the law has to be downgraded. For the rabbis, the giving of the law is not going to be downgraded, but then they have to explain, well, how is it that the patriarchs didn't know it? They say, well, actually the patriarchs did know it. And in the next quote, you can see, we don't have to read it, um, we're told that Jacob also knew the Sinai law before the Sinai law was given. So you see there's an inverse relationship about how the law is treated and whether the patriarchs knew the law or didn't know the law. Let's move on to the question of divine arbitrariness versus human merit. Now, this is interesting because a lot of contemporary Christians are most disturbed by the arbitrariness of God's special favor toward the people of Israel. But weirdly enough, the, Paul is not disturbed by it. And in fact, the ancient rabbis are bugged by it. And Paul, in fact, affirms God's total arbitrariness. And we'll see this in quote 16. And the rabbis attempt to explain and give an explanation for why actually election was not arbitrary. They provide a rationale. 
Grayson, start reading quote 16 for us. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. It is not as though uh, it is not as though the word of God had failed. For not all Israelites truly belong to Israel, and not all of Abraham's children are his true descendants. But it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. Nor is that all. Something similar happened to Rebecca when she had conceived children by one husband, our ancestor Isaac even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose of election might continue, not by works, but no, by no, his. Notice how arbitrary that is. Before they're even born, they're in the womb. Jacob's favored, Esau's not. You're out of luck. Paul is like an early Calvinist, right? Arbitrariness is not a problem. But have a look at the rabbis, what they do. Can you re start reading quote 17 for us, Grayson, please? Uh, uh, Terah was a manufacturer of idols. He once went away somewhere and left Abraham to sell them in his place. Once a woman came with a plate full of flour and requested of him, take this and offer it to them. So he took a stick, broke them, and put the stick in the hand of the largest. When his father returned, he demanded, what have you done to them? I cannot conceal it from you, he rejoined. A woman came with a plate full of fine meal and requested me to offer it to them. One claimed I must eat first, while another claimed I must eat first. Thereupon the largest arose, took the stick, and broke them. Why do you make sport of me, he cried out. Have that, they the, then... the, Wait, wait, the person who cried out was Terah. He's saying, Terah says to his son, Abraham, why, did, wh wh why are you making fun of me? And he, he's saying, they, have, they don't have any knowledge. And then Abraham responds, should not your ears listen to what your mouth is saying? Right? These are idols. So here, the rabbis present a rationale background before Genesis 12, when Abraham is called, they view Abraham as having reasoned himself to monotheism, having become the first monotheist. So then Abraham is not called Balt out of the blue. He's called by God because he arrived and found God first, right? So it's interesting. One of the things that contemporary Christians find most problematic about chosenness is actually affirmed in the New Testament, but in rabbinic theology is sort of like, the rabbis are touchy about it. They don't like this idea that the Jews are favored for no particular reason. They think there is a reason and they provide a backstory to it. I have another longer midrash on here, which a famous repeat occurs across the rabbinic corpus numerous times. And it, 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 it's built on this quote from Deuteronomy 33 two, the Lord came from Sinai and basically, it's about God going out to other nations and saying, particularly the other nations at the time, the people of Ishmael, the people of Is of of uh, um, uh, the, the uh, Abraham's uh, Abraham's other son Ishmael, um, Ammon and Moab, Esau, right? And each of them, God goes to them and says, "Well, here is the list of things that are in the Torah." And they're like, well, you know, this has this law in it. We really don't like that. We can't do it. And only Jacob and Jacob's children accept the law. So again, it's not that God mysteriously just comes to the people of Israel and says, I'm giving you the law. It's that he goes all out through the world and offers the Torah at all these different groups. Each group in turn turns it down. And only the people of Israel say, Nasev and Ishma, we will do and we will obey, right? We 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 will we we will do and we will will heed your commandments. Um, okay. Last things that I want to talk about. I have a few more quotes on here, and then we'll do Q and A. Which is one of the interesting things is that Jews and Christians actually enact some of the sibling rivalry stories from Genesis, but they enact it in an even more extreme form than actually occurs in the Bible. And that's probably because 
rabbinic Judaism, which is the Judaism that we know today, and early Christianity rose in close proximity to each other and in close competition with each other. And the heat of that relationship, I think, led to sort of more exclusive and extreme readings of the sibling rivalry stories in the Hebrew Bible. So Grayson, can I get you to read quote number 19, which is a text from Galatians, from Paul, from near the end of Galatians. Start reading that for us. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Now this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One woman, is, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and co corresponds to the present Jerusalem, where she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free and she is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children, burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs, for the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. But just as at that time, the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Yeah, this is a pretty radical rereading of this passage because it associates Mount Sinai and, in some sense, the Jews who observe Mount Sinai, um, who observe the laws of Mount Sinai, as, as Ishmael, the disfavored older child, and Isaac is the early church who is not enslaved by the laws of Sinai. Paul has a negative reading of the law, so negative that he associates it with Ishmael. And, but it's also a brilliant tour de force reading because in some sense, you could say the church is the new and up and coming sibling who's displacing the older sibling, the Jewish people, the historic Jewish people. Now, you should know that the rabbis in turn had an equally exclusivist reading and it was probably generated by the heat of this rivalry with early Christianity. Grayson, start reading quote 20 for us. Um, could you scroll down before I start oh, reading? Yep, yep, absolutely. Sorry, <laughs> my you. bad. I'm not good <laughs> with all these technical things. I can't keep track of everything. Go ahead. Uh, for the portion of the Lord is his people, a parable. A king had a field which he leased to tenants. When the tenants began to steal from it, he took it away from them and leased it to their children. When the children began to act worse than their fathers, he took it away from them and gave it to the original tenant's grandchildren. When these two became worse than their predecessors, a son was born to him. He said to the grandchildren, leave my property. You may not remain therein. Give me back my portion so that I may repossess it. Thus also, when our father Abraham came into the world, unworthy descendants issued from him, Ishmael, and all of Keturah's children. When Isaac came into the world, unworthy descendants issued from him, Esau and all the princes of Edom, and they became worse than their predecessors. When Jacob came into the world, he did not produce unworthy descendants, rather all his children were worthy. As it is said, and Jacob was a perfect man dwelling in tents. When did God repossess his portion? Beginning with Jacob, as it is said, for the portion of the Lord is his people, Jacob the lot of his inheritance, and for the Lord have chosen Jacob for himself. Okay, well, first I'll state this rabbinic parable is very, very close to the parable of the wicked tenants in Matthew 21, which seems equally exclusivistic. And certainly the way that it's told in the gospels is that the Jewish authorities who heard it took it as that God was going to dispossess the Jewish people and give and start a relationship with another group of people because they were being disobedient. Well, certainly that's the way the gospels depict this. Now, one of the things that you see in both the Galatians passage and in this rabbinic parable is that the sibling rivalry that's described in Genesis is transposed into a binary system in which you're either the chosen child or you're the hated child. You're either the chosen or you're the dispossessed. But notice 
in Genesis, I have quote 21, and I'll read it. As for Ishmael, this is from Genesis 17, when God announces that Sarah is going to have a baby, Abraham's like, you're insane. She's not going to have a kid. She's 90 years old. That's not going to happen. He starts laughing. And God's like, oh, no, it's going to happen. But he says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless him. I will make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of 12 princes. I will make him a great nation. Does that sound like Ishmael is hated? No. In the Bible, a lot of the non-chosen siblings are not the anti-chosen. But in rabbinic Judaism and in early Christianity, with the heat of the two movements against each other, they tended to read the Genesis story in this more binary framework of you were either the beloved son or you were the wicked hated son. Whereas in the biblical text itself, there's quite a bit of room to be both, to be non, not the chosen son, but not hated, maybe even blessed, but not the child of the promise, right? So my point in bringing this up is there's often also a tendency for people to think, well, earlier texts are more exclusivistic and later texts are more inclusivistic. This is not really the case. The bi earlier biblical text is more moderate and tells a more complicated story than some of the early rabbinic and the New Testament texts do when they interpret these Genesis stories. Their interpretation is maybe more extreme. So one of the things that Jews and Christians might give some thought to is, are there ways in which at times the biblical text might help us moderate and create more theological space for the other whom we seem to be closely related to than let's say the New Testament or the rabbinic text that we tend to, the frameworks that we tend to read this Hebrew Bible text through might distort what the Hebrew Bible is actually saying. That doesn't mean that the Hebrew Bible is containing notions that we might not find problematic, but it does seem to me that in general, the stories in Genesis on the whole offer a lot more theological space for the rival sibling than some of these texts from the New Testament or the rabbinic era do. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say and I don't want to yabber on too long. I'd rather leave time for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaminsky. Are you ready to uh, begin conversation? Uh, I am ready as I'll be. <laughs> well, we do have one question right now in the chat. And as I pose it to you, I invite others to feel free to weigh in on the chat as well. Um, and this question comes from St. Paul Lutheran uh, community, I suppose. Um, and the writer wonders whether your reading is based on a pre-new perspectives um, reading of Paul. And I think what he means by that is that more contemporary scholarship understands Paul as a Jew that is maybe more sympathetic to the law and to his Jewish identity than has been previously appreciated. Uh, but the person who posed the question can feel free to nuance it. And, uh, and he asks, or she asks, does this new reading affect the relationship of Judaism and Christianity, whether in Paul's time or an hour? So again, I think the question is, how does a, a more sympathetic uh, or a more, um, I guess, Jewish understanding of Paul impact your reading and broader Jewish-Christian relations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm familiar with the new perspective and I, I still, Look, I think the main thing that the new perspective, I, from my vantage point, points out is, yes, Paul has more sympathy for the Jewish position in the new perspective, but ultimately, Paul still sees Jesus as the essential linchpin, and I, I think some of it depends on whether you have what, they, what, what you'd call a sort of two-covenant theory a sort of Christian Stendhal view of things. And I'm not, I, I guess the way that I would say to this, I wish I could believe that Paul really had in mind the two covenant theory that you can, that Jews can be right with God through the commandments and that Gentile Christians could be right with God through belief in Jesus. 
but I'm just not sure from my reading of Romans and Galatians that Paul actually thinks that. From my reading, I still think ultimately he thinks that if Jews are going to be right with God, they're probably, they're going to need to accept Jesus. And the law is maybe not as problematic as the traditional Christian reading of Paul would have it, but it's also not ultimately salvific. It hmm. won't get you all the way there. So that's kind of my take on it. Mm -hmm. But I will say that there are powerful readings that have a sort of two covenant notion. Most recently, Paul Griffiths, um, who a uh, very, very thoughtful Catholic theologian has written an important book on the grammar of Israel in which he does forcefully argue for this sort of two covenant theory more widely not just based on the biblical material, but in a wider theological lens. Um, mm. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty compelling. I'm just not sure that I myself, Paul says some fairly derogatory things about the law. And in a lot of new perspective things, uh, thinkers would say, well, he's really just saying that to Gentiles who want to take on the law. He's not actually saying it to Jews who keep the law. But I'm skeptical. I, I, I do think He's got a lot of negative language about Sinai, about the limits of the law, and about the power of belief in Jesus might be the way to put it. There are some great questions coming in to the main chat and to me privately. Before we go to a couple of them, I just want to ask you, Dr. Kaminsky, you know, I guess the question for me is, where do we go from here? If you have shown, I think compellingly, that Judaism and Christianity both have universal aspects and particular aspects that are both expressed in their foundational texts. And it seems like you're arguing that there is not really tension between the particularist claims of chosenness and the universalist streams of thought that we find as well. And so I guess the question that I have, and again, we'll, we'll go to others' uh, questions as well, but do you think that these are useful categories at all? I mean, should we be doing away with universalism and particularism because they are considered to be at odds with one another and in tension with one another? And yet you're here telling us that we find both of these streams in both of our religious traditions? Yeah, yeah. Well, I sure I'd love to do away with them, but it's like any other term that's like widely accepted. It's hard to do away with something, especially in our current cultural valence. The, you know, the current, what I see among my students is if it's not, particularism is bad, universalism is good. And so part of why I play with these categories is to try to push my students to see that these things are more complicated. Mm -hmm. I will also mention that there's a tendency among many people to assume that universalism goes hand in hand with tolerance and particularism goes hand in hand with intolerance. And I generally think that that equation doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. There are times when a universalism can be intolerant and when a particularism can be more tolerant. Um, a classic example would be, a, a universalism would be if somebody comes into your culture well, you have to you you have to accept them fully into your culture, but they also have to fully accept your culture. They can't maintain their own tradition in your culture. Um, so, the you know I think particularism can be uh, the example that I give is when one looks at there's a tension in the Torah between Leviticus seventeen fifteen and Deuteronomy fourteen twenty one. In Leviticus seventeen fifteen. Resident aliens, people who are foreigners who are living among the people of Israel, have to observe Israelite purity regulations. That is a form of it, radical inclusion, but it's radical inclusion that forces these resident aliens to observe Israelite mores. In Deuteronomy 14.21, resident aliens are not forced to observe Israelite purity regulations. They are excluded from it. They are not as included, but you might say it's more tolerant. It lets them do their own thing without having to observe Israelite mores. So things can be complicated. They don't fall out on a, on a single plane. I, yeah. I know Malka has written on this thing, and I, 
uh, sure, I'd be all in favor of trying to do away with it, but it's so pervasive in our culture. And because of our enlightenment sort of mores of the universal being good and the particular being bad and things like chosenness and the commandments and as being viewed as particularities and as quirks of the tradition that aren't really at the heart of what religion is about, I, I'm not sure how you can get rid of it and still talk to people when it's so prevalent in the culture. So I guess that's my answer. Well, at minimum, you've complicated the binary, I think, in a very meaningful way. Um, I, want to, um, I, I want to bring to your attention a question that was sent to me uh, privately. And um, I'm not going to say the person's name because I don't know if they want me to. Uh, but uh, the question is, how much of what we find in the rabbinic tradition do you think is a reaction to Christianity? Yeah, that's a complicated question. Um, I think without detailed evidence of making it, and you have to look at each of these, each of the stories, the midrashic stories and the unfolding logic, you have to look carefully and see what evidence can you bring to show that it's an actual reaction versus just a natural unfolding of the tradition. Because there are ways in which the logic of the tradition might unfold in a way that looks like it's heat directed at, at another group of people, but it might not be that. It's mm -hmm. also possible that it's a both and, that the logic of the tradition is unfolding over time and there are socio uh, historical realities. Of course, just knowing that Christians are around is not the same as knowing that the rabbis were familiar with a particular Christian interpretation, but there are, evident, there are pieces of evidence that show at times that we know that we can see that Christians and Jews were living in. Michal Barasher Siegel um, has done quite a bit of work on sort of mapping out Jewish versus Christian sites next to each other and has shown particular times, particularly in the East where the Babylonian traditions were written in the Sasanian Empire in which it's clear that a rabbinic interpretation more than likely is being influenced by a particular, that they're in dialogue with a Christian, that they're aware of some specific Christian interpretations related to like the incarnation or other things like that. So I, th I think it's a case by case basis. So interesting. That's a great setup, Joel, because Michal Bar Asher Siegel is delivering our Spring Shapiro lecture coming up on April 8th in just a couple months. So I did not know that you were going to mention her name, but I really am delighted because I, I think you're absolutely right. And these talks will definitely be connected. Maybe we'll close with two questions that are both uh, related to the Second Vatican Council teachings on uh, the Jewish people. So Julie Heath Elliott asks, do you think that the Nostra Aetate teaching that the premises are eternal has helped to mitigate this, uh, these very ancient expressions of sibling rivalry? And I'll also bring to you Michael Perlmuter, and Michael has a very special relationship with CTU. His parents had a, a found decades-long uh, relationship with CTU, and I, if it's the Michael Perlmuter I'm thinking of, his father Chaim Perlmuter, blessed memory, was uh, the founding um, the, the 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 founding uh, crown. I don't know if he was a Crown Ryan chair or he was the Sister Arbery can can correct me, but he was the first rabbi on faculty at CTU. Uh, and so Michael asks, what role does Vatican II's position on Jewish salvation in and through the authority of the Torah have to do with this discussion of sibling rivalry? So I guess the question generally has to do with, okay, so what now? What can and should uh, members of the Catholic Church be saying about their, uh, their, their, their Jewish siblings? Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I, th I think uh, as, as, a, as a Jewish person, there's limits to what I can tell Christians what they, what they should be doing, just as there's limits to what. One of the things that I really appreciate about Paul Griffith's book, at least on the one side, is that he's like, I'm mapping out a Catholic view of how Catholics might think about the historic people of Israel, the Jews in a theological system, but I wanna be very cautious about saying that Jews need to be accepting what I'm saying because 
there's been a historical imbalance. Christians have particularly over centuries have persecuted Jews and I'm not here to dictate what Jews should be thinking. And, I, and even though Jews have been on the oppressed side of that balance sheet, ultimately Catholics need to figure out their theology. Of course, I can chide them some or say, might you do this, might you do that? Um, is there another way that you might do it? Or rejecting some of the ways that 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 people do do come up with, um, saying I find that problematic. Um, I certainly think things like Nostra Aetate have helped immensely. But what I would say is, when I get into the classroom, what I notice is it's not necessarily like those views from the theologians have pervaded widely in the public mind of your average Catholic who comes into my class, they're not necessarily aware of that. So I know that some of it's in the catechism and it does get taught, but I just don't know how widespread it is. So I would say, you know, there's got to be a sort of better pipeline to be able to disseminate these sort of more positive teachings that um, that might have a you know that might reach the wider public in a in a more efficient way and I don't know exactly how to do that but I just I just know from my own experience in the classroom it seems like um, you're always starting from ground zero and people aren't aren't aware of this or it's not on the top of the agenda of course one of the problems is and this is the same thing that I, you know, you know, among Jewish students or among Protestant students, of course, religions are designed to primarily um, train you in the basics of your religion and, you know, learning about interreligious relations and the complexities of theological dialogue aren't necessarily, you first have to learn your, your own tradition before you can start learning how your own tradition stands vis-a-vis -vis other related traditions. but. Um, so it is a difficult task. It's not, it's hard to do with 12 year olds. It's more likely to happen with high schoolers or with college level or with adult learners, people who are in churches and in synagogues. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say is, um, I'm just not sure how, you know, I think a lot of the scholars are getting it right, but I just don't know how widely that scholarship is pervading the larger church. Sure. Yeah, I think um, I think trickle down is really a big issue that our faculty talks a lot about. And I know Father John Falkowski talks about this as well, trickle down from the teachings of the Second Vatican Council down to the pews. And I think he uh, he once said to me, I asked him, how many years do you think it will take for the teachings of Nostra Aetate to disseminate? And then he looked very thoughtful and he said 500 years. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> change is yeah, 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 so I'm not saying it's not doing good or that, you know, it's obviously, I'm, I'm an optimist and not a pessimist, but I'm also a realist. I, I know these, these, things, these things take time, they do. Um, I will say on the Michal Bar Asher Siegel, me, at Smith College, we hired Michal Bar Asher Siegel when she was doing her PhD to come and teach our students. She was a huge success. The students here loved her. She taught for us a number of times. She's a total dynamo. So yes. I highly recommend you attend her talk. Um, you'll you'll enjoy it. She she's fabulous. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we need to keep pushing it. I think it's great that somebody like Malka is in a Catholic institution in direct dialogue um, as part of a Catholic institution that a Catholic would hire a Jewish professor. This is huge. This is not something you would have seen 60 or 70 years ago. And I experienced something like this. I taught at St. Olaf for a time, a Protestant institution, a Lutheran institution. And when I was hired, it was because Robert Jensen, who was a theologian, was involved in, in Protestant uh, Jewish dialogue, and he thought it was essential that a Jew who was a Bible scholar be hired by a Lutheran institution, and he made it a point to hire me there, and I was, it was the first time it had happened, so these, this is progress. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kaminsky. And thank you, Grayson, for this illuminating talk and Grayson for your support. I wonder, Dr. Kaminsky, whether we could trouble you to send us your source sheet if you're willing. Oh, yeah. Oh, find yeah. A way to post it on the CTU website in tandem with the recording of this lecture because it was so rich and extensive. And I think that um, it really speaks to the, the way in which you very compellingly complicated the binary of Jewish particularism and Christian universalism. So if you are willing, I-, I Absolutely. To, okay, w- wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, please stay tuned for our coming events, especially, like I said, our Spring Shapiro lecture with the extremely charismatic and talented Dr. Michar Bar- Asher Siegel on April 8th. That event will be both in person and over Zoom. So if you're and, in the Chicago- and, and, and I believe April 8th is the day of the lunar eclipse. No, solar eclipse. It's like a huge thing. So we'll the all go outside eclipse. and we'll look at the eclipse and then we'll go inside and we'll learn with Michal <laughs> or the opposite order. Um, and I'm also looking forward to May 8th when we'll be hosting a panel event on the varieties of contemporary Jewish culture. We'll have a scholar of Iraqi Jewry and Moroccan Jewry and I think Yemenite Jewry. So we're planning for that and I'm very excited. Um, thank you again, Dr. Kaminsky and Grayson and thanks to all of you for making the time. Life is so busy. And uh, I know there are so many things going on in your lives. So thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Stay tuned for registration information about these events on our C2 events uh, website. And until next time, take good care and uh, good night, good morning, and good afternoon.